Glendalough, the Valley of the Two Lakes. Located in County Wicklow, one of Ireland's most scenic and popular tourist attractions. The world famous Round Tower is the focal point of this monastic settlement founded by St. Kevin in the 6th century. Over half a million tourists visit Glendalough each year. Although it's well known for its monastic ruins and breathtaking scenery, just how many people realize that this ancient glacial valley also boasts a rich mining history? Mining in Glendalough dates back to the turn of the 19th century when the manager of the Avoca mines, Thomas Weaver, was commissioned by the government to undertake a survey of gold in County Wicklow. Not long after the 1798 rebellion, he discovered a rich vein of lead ore in the Glendasson Valley. The first records we have of miners coming up here was in the early 19th century when an eminent geologist by the name of Weaver from Dublin came up here trying to describe the geology and he noticed some indications of the very white quartz that we see lying around the hillside here. You see boulders of white quartz and that quartz is associated with the mineral veins. You also quite often see in some cases um, patches of rust on the hillside and this is where the minerals are being oxidized close to the surface and again that's another indicator. The most lead I saw in any of those mines was in the Maldial and it was a vein about 20 inches thick of solid black lead. It came out in wagons, it was the very same as coal. Yeah, never seen the like of it, but that only lasted for a short time. The lead would be very, very, very narrow, but then sometimes they'd widen out. But for the most part, it'd be pretty narrow. Sometimes you would have a vein of lead three, four, five inches wide for short periods of time, which would be very rich and that would be maybe bringing out seven or eight tons of lead in one blast. Other times that would be a very narrow vein and there may be less than a ton in a blast. Glendalough is a glacial valley formed during the Ice Age 20,000 years ago. The two lakes in the valley were created after the ice eventually melted away. But how do these veins of lead come about? Millions of years ago, the collision of continental plates resulted in the formation of the Wicklow Mountains, a large granite mass. As the granite eventually cooled, cracks appeared, which became filled with hot fluids carrying various minerals. Cooling and chemical reactions caused the metal ores to be deposited as veins in the cracks. This horizontal vein is not related to the mineral deposits, but was formed when the granite was still hardly molten, just crystallizing. It's called a pegmatite, very large crystals. But now within the stoke workings, the stoke, the vein here is about four feet wide. So the work will continue up above my head for about 200 feet. When we just look up into the roof, we can see some of the lead minerals that the miners are trying to mine. This is an example of one of the mineral veins, quite a small mineral vein, but quite a nice little example. The grey material is the lead ore, galena, that they're trying to mine. The white is quartz minerals. Brown staining is probably from some iron minerals within the vein. This is a typical example of one of the veins. The veins can be very narrow, in this case only two or three inches wide. On the edge here we see the surrounding granite rock. In the middle here we see the white quartz and then through it we see this brownie coloured mineral in fact is zinc blend, zinc sphalerite, which is another one of the minerals they were mining. But again, quite a narrow vein, quite typical of some of the veins around here. In the Wicklow Mountains, lead and zinc are the main ores to be found, although small quantities of silver were also extracted from the lead ore. So what is lead and what is it used for? Lead is a bluish white soft metal that turns a dull grey when exposed to the air. As a metal, it is highly resistant to corrosion. This is why lead has so many applications in both modern and historical times. 
Today, lead is widely used in the construction of buildings, weaponry, electronics assembly, and even for shielding against radiation. Lead has been used for thousands of years because of its widespread and easy to extract and work with. In ancient Rome, lead was used for plumbing. In fact, the English word plumbing, referring to water piping, derives from the Latin word for lead, plumbum. Through the ages, lead was used for weathering roofs and chimneys, kitchenware, weights, seals, paints and pigments. In some cultures, it was even used as currency. Contrary to popular belief, the lead pencil is actually not made from lead, but instead usually graphite mixed with clay. Lead was used for different uses. It was used for dental filling, removing scars and it cured indigestion. Today it's looked on as being toxic and it's removed from many products such as paint, fuel, water piping. It causes ill effects such as headaches, lung and chest problems. There's uh, spile heaps of lead. After all of those years and centuries, you know, the, the, the still there, you can see the, 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 the lead substance and the granite and there's no vegetation or growth of any weed or anything on those spile heaps, which gives a clear indication that there's a lot of poison there. In 1809, Thomas Weaver established the Glendalock Mining Company in partnership with local investors. Weaver was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the mines. The Mining Company of Ireland took over operation of the Glendasson Mines in 1825 when they brought Weaver's shares. The price of lead on the open market was always a factor in the running of the mines. Price fluctuations meant that wages also varied over time, the typical boom and bust of mining in general. Events such as the Great Famine and general economic uncertainties resulted in many experienced miners leaving Wicklow to find work in Australia, England and America during the lifetime of the mines. What did the mining company do to exploit the Glendasson mines? When times were good, the mining company prospered and invested in buildings, equipment and machinery. A road to the Loganur ore body was constructed in 1826 and a railway track for wagons 126 feet into the mine itself was also laid. Floors for separating the ore were built on the site and the Hero Mine was opened to a distance of 30 feet. The Fox Rock Mine was opened in 1828. Over the next 10 years machines for pumping water out of the mines were installed so that lead could still be extracted. There was also a crushing mill installed and a new water wheel replaced horsepower. The Ruppla mine and a new pump house opened in 1835. The 1850s saw a big improvement in lead prices and a new wave of investment followed with the old workings being reopened. A new crushing mill erected and machinery brought in. A new forge was built in the 1870s which saw further advances in machinery and cut the cost of labour. This meant that two or three boys could now do the work of nine men. The miners would try and follow the vein downwards, uh, sinking what is called a shaft, a vertical excavation, going downwards into the ground. Uh, it's reputed that some of the shafts here were up to 200 fathoms, that's 600 feet in depth. Um, in addition to going vertically downwards, the miners also went horizontally alongwards, along into the side of the hills. And these are called adit workings. And we can see dotted across the hillside lots of entrances to these adit workings. And the adit workings serve two purposes. One is to get access to the mines, but also to provide a means of draining some of the mine water out from the workings. The mineral itself was extracted underground, um, essentially using hand labour and using explosives. The, it was a very long and slow process. The miners would have to drill holes, shot holes, into the rock using hand machinery. Basically a long uh, steel chisel, about six feet in length, that was held by one person and a second person that would hit that rod with a hammer and turn it slightly and drive to make a hole in the rock. In 
With a general rise in population came a demand for housing, and the Mining Company of Ireland built houses for their workforce, believing both the miners and the company would benefit. Built in the mid-1850s, a row of houses close to the mining works is reputed to have once housed eight musicians, hence the name Fiddler's Row. Why I think it was called Fiddler's Row was when they were all occupied, there was a musician supposedly in every house. What was good about living up there? Well, I suppose we didn't appreciate the quiet and the tranquility, actually, that was up there. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, it was, it was beautiful up there, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even though the weather would be very harsh up in the Glendasson Valley, wouldn't well, it? Well, we walked from there to school down here. And, like, we came down to Lara to school? Yeah, yeah. What was it like growing up in the valley, the Glendasson Valley? I wish to God I was back there again. You serious, why Oh, that? yeah. In 1864, the Mining Company of Ireland built a school to provide for the children of their workforce. The national school system was established in Ireland in 1831. The mining school operated alongside the national schools and the private Church of Ireland school in the Glendalough area. One of the school registers in the 1870s illustrates the number of miners' children attending the school. A very important aspect of mining exploration is the use of timbers to support the tunnels. The shafts and tunnels needed to be propped up as the miners worked their way into the mountain. In the 1850s and 60s, the Mining Company of Ireland planted approximately one million trees in the Glendalough Valley for use as timber props in the mines. This was also a commercial venture for the company as some of the timber was sold on the open market, adding to the company profits. The Mining Company of Ireland planted almost a million trees between 1857 and the late 1860s. The main species planted were European larch and Scots pine for making the excavations safe for the mine workers. In the 12th century, most of the area would have been covered with oak woodland with an understory of holly and hazel. From the 13th century then to the 17th century, tree clearance would have taken place. Coppicing is the felling of trees and the harvesting of the shoots from the felled stumps. This is done usually on a 15 to 30 year rotation. But unfortunately, uh, during this time, harvesting was done every 5 to 10 years, which weakened the stumps and eventually they died out altogether, leading to a time in the 19th century when then the lock was almost treeless. Reports, I suppose, in the early 1800s when mining would have first started in the valleys, claim that Glendalough and Glendasan were very dark and dismal places with hardly any trees in the, in the valley at all. So that of course would have significantly changed what would have occurred here, you know, there would have been much less bird life, squirrels wouldn't have been as abundant. Red deer died out, went extinct in Wicklow during the 1800s and were reintroduced later on. So there would have been actually a lot less wildlife here when the miners lived in the valleys. The Scots Pine along the Miners Road in Glendalough was planted in the 1850s by the Mining Corporation of Ireland. It was planted to become pit props for use in the mines but it was never harvested so it's, it's great for us to have it now as a reminder of the mining era but also as a great habitat for red squirrels and crossbills and things like that. By the 1850s, 200 men were working above and below ground and 120 tonnes of lead ore was produced each month. As well as working below ground, the miners were involved in building the Roman Catholic parish church at Lara. Despite being in the middle of the famine years, the money to build the church was raised, and after four years it was opened on St. Kevin's Feast Day, the 3rd of June, 1851. The other major religious denomination, Church of Ireland, was not neglected, as some miners contributed to the building costs of St. John's Church in Lara in 1843. As Father Matthew, the temperance priest, toured the country in the 1840s, preaching the virtues of abstaining from alcohol, the miners also came under his gaze. Some were criticised for their overindulgence. While he was responsible for many people giving up drink, it was still a problem among certain miners. In the 1870s, the local RIC force was not able to cope with drunk miners who got into brawls on payday, and extra forces were called in from Roundwood. It's probably no surprise that the men drank and played hard, as their working day down the mines was anything but easy. The average life expectancy for a miner was 42 years. The work was dangerous, 
and the risk of tunnels collapsing was always present. And this is exactly what happened in 1825, when two miners were trapped by a rock fall. The accident was not discovered until the next shift change occurred, and the men were finally rescued after 33 hours. The Kamaderi Mountain separates the two valleys and the two mines, the Dundasan Mine and the Glendalough Mine. The Luganur mineral vein cuts across Kamaderi Mountain between the two valleys. The workings in the Glendasan Valley were connected by a tunnel through Kamaderi Mountain into Glendalough. This allowed for natural drainage of the Lugalur shafts and tunnels and made transportation of the ore for processing Glendalough Valley easier. We're here now on the Wicklow Gap Road and um, we're looking over on the flats here was Rupla, which was one of the early minings and further up along the hill we have a sand spoil out of one of the big mines which I've been up three or four times but we can't find any entrance to and the top one to the best of my knowledge is the one that connects from this valley into Glendalock on the far side. Exploration work started in the Glendalock Valley in the 1850s with the construction of a second set of buildings including a water wheelhouse and crushing mill. Here in Glendalock is where the lead mines started up in the 1860s. Having broken through the mountain from the lead mines in Glendasson, they found lead um, coming through just above the upper lake here at uh, Glendalough. This machine uh, dates from around about 1900 and it's a crusher. The lead ore when it's brought out is still attached to a lot of rock and what they want to do is to crush it so that they can then separate the lead ore from the rock. And these two rollers here would be rolling against each other. The rock would go in there, it would be crushed and come out uh, at the bottom where it would be collected and it brought off for centrifuging. So when the um, mines closed, the value of this piece of machinery was probably less than the cost of bringing it out of here. So while just about everything else was moved away and uh, reused or sold for scrap, it seems that nobody thought it worthwhile moving this. So it remains as a permanent monument to that particular phase of, of mining in Glendalough. Workings further up the Glendalough Valley were developed. The far end of the valley was aptly named Van Diemen's Land by the miners because it seemed so far away from civilization. High up in the valley above the waterfall, there were more mines uh, in fairly desolate moorland up there, which the miners called it Van Diemen's Land, named after what's now Tasmania, which was a penal colony where the criminals were sent for sheep stealing or whatever. Mules were initially used to carry materials up the steep mountainside and bring the ore down. This was later replaced by an inclined railway which resulted in greater efficiency and productivity. Although mining in this valley only lasted for approximately 20 years, the mined lead continued to be processed here even into the 1900s. From here we can see uh, towards the head of the valley of, of Glendalough, past the spoil heap on the right and in behind there's a a uh, large building in ruins, which was a mill driven by a water wheel where the lead ore was crushed. Behind it, going across horizontally, there is a stone wall, which is the remains of the dam, as they dammed the river to provide the water supply for the water mill. Now, this is a hopper where the um, miners bringing the lead ore out of the mountain would have carried it down and tipped into this hopper. It's like a, a storage area um, because the next stage was uh, people would break up the stone with hammers to try and get more lead out of it but for the time being it would be stored in here until somebody working over here needed more they'd come over with a barrow, fill the barrow and bring it off to work on it over in that direction. Um, what we're looking at here is picking floors. Um, this was the first real stage of working on the, the, the stone that was brought out of the mines. It was brought down into the hopper, then there was a lot of people on this area uh, ready to work on it. Um, what they would do was they would bring in uh, lumps of stone, or uh, granite basically, or quartz uh, coming out of the granite that had lead ore in it. But what they needed to do was to separate as much of the rock away from the lead ore. And you can see here that the area is cobbled 
and that's to give a firm hard surface because what they did was they took each rock with a hammer and they broke it up with a hammer and hand picked out the pieces of lead ore. Once the um, lead had been separated out there was still some rock sticking to it so what they did was they loaded it onto little trolleys and they were brought off to the crushing mill to um, crush them down finer so they could be processed. And what we see here is the posts that supported a trackway, a railway, bring those trolleys over. And they're in pairs, they're sloping in, and there is a joint at the top where the horizontal timbers would have slotted in, and then the rails on top of them. And this became higher as it left the platform of the spoil heaps and led over towards the crushing mill in the background. So the broken up pieces were moved away and they could be crushed in the mill. So what we see here is the mill building that was used for crushing the ore. In behind you can see a waterfall, so there's a substantial river coming down here. And the water was brought on a high up trestle, it's called a leet, which is a mill race up on stilts, over to the building and the water wheel was fixed to the left hand side of the building as we look at it here. The water fell onto it and turned the wheel and turned the crushers inside that crushed the, the, the stone into a much finer powder than what it was when it left the picking floors. The 1880s saw a major decline in the fortunes of the Mining Company of Ireland, which had experienced losses over several years. The lead was running out in the areas being worked, and world prices for lead were in decline. Employment fell dramatically, and many of the most experienced miners had emigrated to England and America. The mines were put up for sale in 1888. The mines changed hands once again when the Mining Company of Ireland sold them to the Wynne family in 1890. The Wynnes were an Irish family with previous mining experience in the Avoca and Lirmalur mines. This operation didn't run too smoothly however. After a few years, mining came to a halt due to problems with flooding and a lack of machinery. Needing cash to develop the underground workings, in 1913 the Wynnes set up a water plant in the Glendalough Valley to treat the waste from the mines in both the Glendasson Valley and Van Diemen's Land. The waste was transported on a tramway and loaded by hand onto a crusher by a mainly female workforce. The crushing work continued until 1925. The demand for lead during the years in the First World War, 1914 to 1918, brought the Glendalough mines to the attention of the Ministry of Munitions in London which granted aid to the winds to reopen the Fox Rock mines in Glendasson. However, government financial support was withdrawn at the end of the war. Funds dried up and so did the mining. For over 20 years there was no mining until St. Kevin's lead and zinc mine was set up by J.B. Wynne along with other investors in 1948. A workforce of 80 operated it for nine years. They were divided into two main groups with 55 men employed underground and 25 men employed in the processing plant and on compressors. A lot of men started working in the processing plant at the age of 16. Each shift had four men to operate the plant. The shift supervisor oversaw three others, a man collecting the process lead from the jig tables, a man feeding the raw material to the crusher and a third man dumping the rock into the crusher house. I was let down into a hopper, uh, the crusher house to call it. And I was there with a shovel and I filled in the crusher. And I went along a belt then, and into rolls. Then the separator would open, some went into the rough stuff, went into the hoppers to call them, the jigs, he kept jigging away. And uh, the pebbles, uh, the pebbles, uh, lead to come out. A fitter? A helper and a man for bagging the lead also worked above ground. Many men started work in the processing plant and then discovered that the men underground had much better wages, so they approached their supervisor to get a job down the mine. When these young men first went underground, they worked filling wagons and shoveling ore, and then moved on to helping a driller. Then came opportunities to drill a few shallow holes and charge these with explosives. Eventually, after a couple of years,
they could become drillers themselves. Miners worked in pairs, a driller and a helper, in three eight-hour shifts per day. There were about four pairs working each shift. Day shift started at 8 a.m. and they drilled 30 holes, each five feet deep, into the face of the rock that would be blasted at lunchtime. After lunch, they started filling wagons with the broken rock, usually about 30 wagons of rock from one blast, approximately 15 tons. In the centre of the rock face was a vein of lead two to three inches wide, and that was the important area. The remainder was waste. And then you'd be getting out when the dynamite was going off. And then there was another shift coming in and they'd muck it out. They right, used to call it muck it out. Yeah, right. that was the uh, bogies there. And for bogeying out all the stuff, it was that come in, come out and was loaded into a hopper. Just tipped into a hopper and that all went off in the lorries. That went off then? Oh yeah. yeah. Down the mucky road, down the bog. Oh, down, road, that's, down what, that, that's what made all the potholes, the lorries. That's what it was, yeah. Draw all the stuff out of the mines, yeah. When you go in first in the start of your shift, it's possible you may have to put out a set of tracks. If the tracks were out, you might do it, otherwise the men, the shift coming on, wouldn't be able to get up for to get the muck. They'd be delayed way back. Or you might have to put on an air pipe for to get the air up to you. Then you set up your machines and do the boat. About 30 holes in the round. I was uh, pushing out tubs first up, pushing out the ore. So that was, you were down in the shaft yeah, or wherever it was yeah. and pushing the bogies yeah. back up. And that's yeah. what you did at first. Yeah. And what did you move on to then after that? Well, they well, bought a pony then and I drove it. <laughs> <laughs> you still did the same work, but the yeah, pony was pony doing, was the, doing it. the yeah. hard labour. Yeah. So you were up and down the whole time, all day long. Yeah. yeah. And as for lunch, they bring a bottle of milk stand it up in the corner somewhere <coughs> and maybe a sandwich that was it but they wouldn't even stop the drill the machine the drink and eat as the if they were drilling yeah yeah there were also a number of men filling wagons with ore and extending the rail air and water pipelines the blacksmith sharpened drills and tools pit ponies worked in the tunnels carting the ore from the mine to the processing plant and three men followed the ponies the compressors and generators ran continuously and there was a man on each shift looking after this machinery to ensure air pressure was adequate at all times. The pony come right to that tip head there, right to the top, yeah. And he was unyoked, he was yoked up with the shafts and the, the tunnel just twisted because they followed the vein. The vein was on an angle all the way in but it also, wherever the vein went, they kept it in the centre of the face. With the result, like that, there was, uh, you had a crooked track, you know, there were big bends in it, but the pony knew them all. And if you dawdled a bit in front of them, you held the winkers with one hand and the carboid lamp in the other one. And you marched out ahead of them. But if you were a bit slow coming to a corner that he knew he wanted to be a speed up for, to get these wagons around it, he hit you a bump in the behind and <laughs> he raking you up like and keep you going, you know. <laughs> Your father was a captain here. Mine right? captain, he came from Irish or in Scotland as, as mine captain. To, yeah. And he, he, had, he had the general running of, of the mine. He was responsible to the mine manager who was a Tipperary man, mining engineer from Tipperary, Jimmy Esmond. And had he mined in Scotland before that? Oh, he had mined all the coal fields of Scotland, England, Wales, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So when he came, moved over here, were you born here or were you born over no, there? No, I was born in the northwest of England. Doing and some mining over there. Yeah. So were you only a little fellow when you came? About nine year old. About yeah. nine year old. Yeah. And you moved into the house down moved the valley. Moved into the house here. down here with no electricity or running, running water or anything like that. But we improvised with our own running water from the from the hillside and yeah. the taps. Yeah. Officially, I wasn't allowed the underground, but I could sneak in with him, a hundred yards behind. And as a small child, it must have been. Yeah. Oh, almost. It must have been an amazing place to come up to. Lovely. Yeah. And there were all a great crew of men here. They got on great with the men, like, you know, the men liked me very much. The mining engineer from Tipperary, Jimmy Esmond, he was an invalid. And I used to have the wagon cleaned out, spotless for him, and a little box for him. He'd be lifted into it and sat on it. And he'd have to do his inspection of the mine from that wagon. And there was another chap delegated to push this wagon around the mine. And he was a blacksmith from Tipperary, Ned Bracken was his name. When it would come back out of the mine, there was a little incline coming back out, and. It was a habit they all had of when they shoved the wagon out, just hop up on the back of it and they get a free trip out. The mining engineer, of course, realised coming out the, the entrance of the mine, the tracks divided and there were points at that and he was afraid that the, the wagon would jump the points. And he, he took the skirts and swear in this wagon 
And he was, well, he knew the danger, but lucky enough nothing happened. One of my jobs was preparing the, the things, if there were any VIPs coming, directors, managers, anything like that, I had to everything, have, to have their helmets and lamps all shining clean and working hard for all them. And uh, yeah. divvy them out to them. And That's it, yeah, yeah give yeah. hand them out to them. And I, used to get, I used to get a tip at the end of the day. Here we have a mining safety helmet used in the 50s. This particular helmet belonged to one of the engineers, Mr. Patrick Wynne. It was made up of, a, of a compressed cardboard, very, very strong, it lasted some years. He spent more of his time in the office, really, than he did in the mine, as you can see by the helmet. A very good gentleman. We also have a carbide lamp here, belonging to a local person. Uh, Joseph Roberts. Joseph is uh, Joe, he's still in England, Hale and Hearty, and uh, as you can see, this lamp got much more use. This was something that got to be used by all miners in earlier years. It was used as a safety device in the case of uh, trapped gases in a tunnel. As you enter the mine, along, if the candle uh, went out, there was poisonous gas and you didn't go any further, you just retreated and back. Here we have a number of uh, drills at different lengths and these were used in the mine to drill the rock for blasting. Uh, they, were, uh, they were operated by two men. One man held the drill while another man struck and this man, I've been told, had such confidence in his striker that when he wanted to start, each time uh, the sledge struck, he turned the drill half turn, but when he felt he wanted to stop, the, the way he was stopping, he put his finger on top of the drill, and the, the striker's concentration was to be so great that immediately he stopped. His concentration had to be 100% all of the time. The two main tunnels in the 1950s were the Fox Rock and the Mall Doyle. Fox Rock was three quarters of a mile long, and the Mall Doyle was less than half a mile long. Work in the tunnels was difficult because of flooding and poor ventilation. As a result, many miners developed lung and chest problems. Did you consider at the time when you were doing it, did you think of it as being dangerous work? It wouldn't cross your mind. Not at all. And what kind of safety measures would you have taken to to ensure your safety when you're down there? Well, the only safety, you had a helmet and that was it. That was that? Oh. And you had your light, obviously. Oh, yeah, you had your lamp on your helmet, you know. Interesting thing, Sonny, you seem to have better hearing than most of the other miners. Why was that? Why is that to you? Well, I always put, even before the, before the ear plugs and muffs came in, I used to use rags or cotton wool or something in them. So you were conscious of protecting your ears right from yeah, the very start? Yeah, and then I always used the plugs when they came in and the earmuffs as well, the boat, and made it did make a difference. You're in your wet clothes all day and if you come out in, in the end of the shift in wet clothes you might go on home in them. There, there was no means of drying clothes or anything. Like. Well, very cold and very windy and you had to be out in all weathers and you had no, no clothes, no protective clothes, you know. So you're just an ordinary? Just your ordinary clothes. You must have been saturated at the end of the day. You would be saturated, yeah. Oh, it was very dangerous. I mean, no one realises it. Oh. And the cold and the wet. And, I mean, there's nowhere them to dry clothes or anything them times. I don't know how they lived, really. Yeah, how they managed. No, no. There was a house over there they used to put them in to dry, but so they wouldn't be dry in the mornings when they come up. Sometimes they had to put them on them wet. To be wet again? Going yes, back wet going back in on the ground. There was no such thing as protective clothing. You had no earmuffs, you had no gloves, you were lifting rocks like you see them there, only small lumps of rocks, freshly blathered. You were lifting them in your bare hands. And there was no earmuffs for the Niles. And a lot of you have got hearing problems from well, I have no there. hearing problem. No, some of you have. No, I've got <laughs> oh, Some of have. <laughs> some of the lads do. Well, I walked in fierce noisy conditions in a boat and in other places, drilling and blasting and all sorts of things. I drive machines now all my life. And, uh, I do hear them at work now. At work, I, I'd be amazed. Uh, there are, even the fellas on the building now, they have to be supplied with sun cream cream and sunglasses walking on the building. You'd and you had no special clothing? You were just wearing... You had no special clothing. clothing. You had ordinary clothing. You had ordinary clothing. And you had a pair of Wellingtons all right because of the water. You had to wear Wellingtons. And they would be ringing wet. Water would be dropping everything. 
and they'd have to ride bikes to Rathdrum and Glen Ely and everywhere. I can't recall any accident. There would be lads get cut hands and yeah. uh, small injuries, maybe a bit of dirt in your eyes, and, but you get that walking down the road. Yeah. So and there was no injuries in it really, and there was no lighting on the ground, there was no electric on the ground, there was no there was bad air, like there was no such thing as a fan for taking out the bad air after the blast or anything like that. And sometimes when you, after the blast, would it be, what was it like when you actually went back down and out? Well, in a lot of the times, the blasting would be, when I was here, it was two shifts, worked on two shifts. The blasting would be done at 12 o'clock at night, and the compressor holes would be left a bit open, and it would, be le it would have till the morning uh, to blow out. But when you be shoveled it out, then up in a dead-end tunnel, the, the expel the explosives all was still in the I'd be very bad. You'd have a lot of headaches all right. Didn't know what safety gear was them times. Lack of money continued to be a problem for St. Kevin's lead and zinc mine. While sufficient ore was found, the company did not have the technology to process it. A Canadian mining company leased the mines from the winds in 1956. Given that mining is a hazardous activity, it's remarkable that there were only three recorded fatalities over the 150-year lifetime of the Glendalough mines. George Reed was killed in 1864 and Thomas Devlin in 1875. The exact cause of their deaths is unknown. Over 80 years passed until the final fatality occurred on the 22nd of January 1957. Two miners were drilling into the rock when tragedy occurred. Their drill somehow struck a piece of dynamite and an explosion hurled the pair to the ground. Jim Myrna, a married man with two young children, was killed instantly. His co-worker, Robbie Carter, was seriously injured. I was working at the pub in England and there was a barman who used to work at the lake above, at the Royal. He came into the pub where I was working the next day and told me about the accident. Tough going that was. Was. Poor Jim Werner was killed that time I was there. Well, that was during your time? Yes. It must have... And Robbie, I mean, sure, Robbie's lucky to be alive. But they didn't think Robbie was going to live that what night. What effect did it have? Oh, period? dreadful. Dreadful. Yeah. Terrible. What was the first word you heard of the accident? I heard it down at my own house, like it was happened in the night. It was in the morning I heard it. Someone called in and told us. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. There was a, a face which had been drilled twice previously and I was really shattered and there were four of us went in at 12 o'clock shift on the 21st of uh, January 1957. There was James Mariner, uh, Joseph Roberts, Andy Foley and myself. Uh, I paired uh, Jim Mariner at a drill f at a rock face on two drilling machines. Andy Foley and Joseph Robert they worked on uh, locomotives and uh, kept the ore sorted out and brought it to the surface. So we went into the mine uh, at 12 o'clock on the 21st of January and there was also with the previous shift, they knew that the, the rounds had been coming badly and uh, they had blasted and they were anxious to see what, how things had gone so they returned into the mine with us and the four of us inspected the the face again it hadn't uh, blasted properly it was a shattered face and hadn't blasted as they wanted so uh, the that shift they went home and uh, we cleared out what had been blasted washed down the face uh, set up the uh, joe roberts and if only set up the drills and we started drilling we were about one hour drilling when a, a drill struck uh, a detonator a loaded hole and it exploded in our face. We were always told never to enter a drill in an old socket and we always uh, adhered to that. Uh, I think what did happen was that we drilled and when we went in a foot or two with the shattered face that the, the crack in the rock took the, the drill in the direction of the hole and there was a detonator there and some jelly knife and that exploded. So um, after the blast, I can remember poor Jim Murray, Jim, my comrade, he was blown down to the ground and I was blown backwards and I tried lifting him and I wasn't able. I was dreadfully, I, I had no strength, my lung, my right lung 
and right arm, there was no strength at all there. So I don't know, I must have decided to walk out and I walked out on the distance three quarters of a mile. I don't know how long it would have taken because I was very, very injured. And um, I got to the surface and met Joe Roberts coming across the bridge and he looked after me, got me back to the, sh to the shed and he raced on into the locomotive to uh, the rock face and they discovered James Merner had passed away. I was taken to St. Coleman's Hospital in Lachlanstown and I was there for three months and uh, my right lung was uh, damaged. A piece of rock had penetrated the lung, the chest bone, and uh, I was a number of years out of work. Uh, I made a good, great recovery, still a bit short of breath, but made a great recovery. So that was a very, very tragic accident. Jim Merner, he was married to a first cousin of mine. He was a lovely fellow to work with. He was 24 years of age, and he had two young children, a three-year-old girl and a two-year-old. And he was a lovely chap, uh, very interested in sport and anything that was going on. And there was great grief altogether for a number of years, and still is with Jim Merner. And uh, that will be 50 years now, this coming January. The Canadian Mining Company, which had taken over the mines in 1956, was not successful in locating the expected amount of lead, and this, along with the fatal accident in January 1957, was the main reason the mines finally closed in the June of that year. As I know it, I finished on the last shift that was worked on the ground. But I would have been on in the morning, it was a day shift, and uh, the shift boss came in, can't remember was it Tom Murphy or Mick Fortin. There were both shift bosses in it. And uh, we were hanging about. We hadn't we'd set up the machines ready to go work and go drilling. And uh, but we were hanging about so we must have been told go in and wait. There was a lot of shock about when the mines closed because there was not a, another employer in the in the area apart from Winds and the estate. So a lot of people even in, in the mining end of it all emigrated or left. When the mines closed here, a lot of them went to England, and more of them went to Avoca to work. Yeah. And an awful lot went to England that time. He arrived in anyhow, and he says, we're finished lads. They have, they're closing her down. They're not driving no more. I mean, it was an awful blow to everybody. And then where they were going to get the next wages, you know? I don't think there was any great panic given one, even. Yeah. I was delighted. <laughs> I was getting a break after all the years, you know, and uh, I remember he was, he said, hang about for a while, don't go out yet, hang around for another hour or so and you'll get the day's pay, because it was about 11 o'clock in the morning when he came in to tell us this, so that's what we done. I think the one thing that kept everyone going here, in bad conditions and everything, was the solidarity and comradeship that existed with all the lads here. There were lads from Rathrum and Glenealy and Avoca and Conry and everywhere. And uh, everyone was here was like a big family. Everyone had died for one another. There was great another. trust between everybody. There was great well. loyalty, comradeship between everyone. And I never seen it in any other job. Everyone was so happy and there was no such a thing as a click of this or a click of that. And a lot of the fellas now that came here from other places, Connery and Belize and all places outside Rathrum, ended up marrying local girls and everyone was like a big family here. Oh, it was a great crack on the whole time. Everyone in, enjoyed it. Everyone was as good as everyone else. Everyone enjoyed it. We shared our food together. Some would have some nice stuff and more would have some wouldn't be so nice. Wouldn't have it at all at the time. But it was very enjoyable. Uh, it was a great relationship in the mine between the miners and uh, we still talk much about the mines even though it's gone 50 years past you know and we still meet up and uh, we enjoy those years. But there's always good crack going on with them Obviously. and you'll be meeting them down then in Burns Alara at that time Jack Burns the pub was a small little pub where Lionham's is today of course no comparison with the two just a small little pub it's, you could you could buy a, a hatchet to cut your cut your timber for your fire. Or you could buy a pound of ashes or a bottle of stout or whatever, and it was just a local pub of the day. 
and of course there's people who have been drinking there and down in the bar in the Royal Hotel, a fella called Tom Timmons with the barman there and fellas being there slagging and having the crack. Of course I didn't drink then but uh, I used to be in there just the same. I went to a dance one night in the hotel, I washed the shirt and iron and put it on me and I went up to the hotel bar in the bar for it. We are going to the dance. Everyone was looking where the steam was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the Willie the shirt was still yeah, drying. It was draining on my back. And, and tell us, so did the girls in the village, did they have an eye to the lads that were working up there? Oh, the yes, now, yes. Know? Oh, yes, you have an eye to them going up and down on the bikes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. 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 Fine fit men that were Fine working up fit the mines, men, yes. Yeah. 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 And they had an extra few bob as well. Yes. We were getting a good bit. A good bit of money more than what the average man was getting outside. Like. Yeah. That was the point about it. Glenda Lock and Lendassen Valleys are now under the care of the Wicklow Mountains National Park, which cares for the natural flora and fauna and surviving built heritage in the area. The Wicklow Mountains National Park uh, covers a landscape of about just over 17,000 hectares actually, and that's all state-owned land. And our role as managers of that land is to conserve the plant and animal communities that occur there, to manage them, to enhance them and also to allow the public to come and appreciate those and give them access to it and to offer education to um, build pe people's appreciation of those animal and plant communities but also um, to facilitate research to um, accommodate local communities and importantly to conserve other significant features within the National Park and they would be things such as artifacts that are left over from human activity of course things like mining heritage. There's a couple of theories on the goats but I suppose one is that uh, the goats were actually farmed in the valley by the miners and when mining declined they were actually let go and just uh, turned feral and have been in the valleys ever since and their herds, herd numbers have grown since. When we look at a natural environment like Glendalock, we have to look at man's influence over the times on it and really there isn't any part of Glendalock that hasn't been untouched by man. You know, the woodlands were planted, the charcoal platforms showed early mining activity in the valley, caves were dug. Um, the spoil heaps are a legacy of, of the, the past in Glendalock, uh, of a different era probably than the older monastic settlement, but they, they show us that man interacted and lived in the valley for over a, a long, long time, and it's just a, it's another phase in the history of Glendalock. History is not just about great world events, it's not just about great leaders like Napoleon, Churchill, de Valera, it's about ordinary people going about their daily lives seeking to make their daily bread and that's exactly what the miners did in Glendasson and in Glendalock. They went into the mines every day in great spirit and in great camaraderie and as we've heard from some of the miners who worked there almost 50 years ago they would have died for one another when they were working together. For some time now Robbie Carter, a former miner, has been talking about preserving the heritage and history of the mines in Glendasson and Glendalock Valleys. Last year, Anne Savage and myself decided now is the time to do something about this and to tell the story of the contribution of the mines to the area. We called a public meeting, a number of people came and from that meeting came the Glendalock Mining Heritage Project Committee. We have a number of former miners and local people on this committee which is chaired by Pat Casey. It's very much a community based project because the miners were very much a part of the community. The committee sees the production of this DVD as phase one of its programme. Phase two is working with the Wicklow Mountains National Park to preserve the heritage of the mines. Phase three, which is probably our most ambitious part of the programme, is the setting up of an information centre in Glendasson which will tell people about the mines and the people who worked there over a period of 150 years. This has long been the vision of a number of the former miners who worked in the mines 50 years ago. I always admired the Glendasson Valley, you know, and uh, it's a beautiful valley and uh, there are a few people who think the same as, as I do. Uh, we'd love to see something happening in that valley that would incorporate the, the old tunnels or mine. And we think it would be a marvellous place for, as a tourist attraction to be able to take some people in there and show them 
what the miners did for their time they were in there, showed them a lead face and the, the workings and bits and pieces of old machinery and uh, it would be very very interesting and uh, as we're getting half, at least half a million tourists per year in Glendalough uh, and all year round it would be a, an extra attraction for Glendalough and it would be well worth while project we, we think we have set up uh, a mining heritage committee and are working hard for the past year with this in mind you know and hoping that at some stage we will be able to see our dream come true. I'd love to see it as a heritage centre where people come and it could be it could be not alone for the last mines it could be explained to them all about the mining history of the area the, 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 the mine heaps we see up there that we'd nothing to do with like only looking at them and the whole history I think it would be very interesting for the future for you and you know it's amazing, young people are very interested in things like that. It would certainly, yeah. certainly highlight the locality up around here, yeah. There's lots of people come to Glendalough as tourists and they don't know about this place up here at all. Oh, I think it'd be a great idea. Yeah. Like we're just saying it's a pity it went so far, but no one did think of it earlier. But you see, everyone was so devastated at that time that just wouldn't, never thought about it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see it happen, and I, I've, I, not just on the mining end of it, but just on place names and everything else that's in the valley at the moment, which is being lost as, 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 as the generations die in. We have this um, annual get-together organised, and the first one of them that organised the trip back up on a minibus, and uh, it was 40, 1957, 45 years. Later. Later, when I arrived back here. Back to where we're standing, actually. Glendalough, the Valley of the Two Lakes, has a rich and vibrant history covering the story of human settlement from St. Kevin to the 1798 Rebellion to the present day. In the Garden County, the landscape of the Glendalough and Dundasson Valleys also rests as testimony to the men who toiled in the lead mines for over 150 years. The miners themselves and the women who supported them will now be remembered as part of the special spirit and heritage which is Glendalough. <laughs>